Hello, 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 and welcome to episode 8 of the Invictus Racing League podcast with me, Gav, joined as always by Sab. And uh, Sab, we had a, a really, really fun Hungarian Grand Prix, which we're going to be talking about in over the next uh, 20 or so minutes. And uh, apart from that, it's been, a, it's been a pretty exciting week of Formula 1. Yes, it has. Uh, we uh, seen the Hungarian Grand Prix that it's not always having to be about overtaking and uh, wheel banging to be an exciting race. It was, it was an interesting race of strategy, which we will get on with. And we also had some some fun and interesting races this week in, in our league. So, yeah, plenty to talk about tonight. It's going to be should be a good episode. Yeah, good. looking forward to episode eight and... We said before with episode seven, it doesn't feel like we've done so many, but yeah, really enjoyed it so far. Hope you lot are as well. Always good to hear your feedback. And uh, yeah, we are currently live on twitch.tv. So you, if you are listening to this back on SoundCloud, uh, Podbean, Spotify or YouTube, you can join us on Thursday nights at 8 p.m. on twitch.tv live and getting involved in the comments. So drop in, let us know what you're thinking if you are here and listening live. But uh, on to tonight and uh, yeah so it's the Hungarian Grand Prix just gone and uh, a really really fun race and there was there was plenty of action plenty of stuff going on on track and uh, we'll start off with the big news and uh, of course that's Lewis and Mercedes with uh, a strategic master stroke uh, master stroke from them really yeah it was it um see I'm not a, a big Lewis and Mercedes fan I'll admit that but what they did Last weekend was uh, very, very clever. They knew, they knew, didn't they? As soon as they pit with that big gap back to third, they had free space to pit and put Hamilton on those faster, medium tyres. Max was pretty much a sitting duck, wasn't he? he? He couldn't come into the pits the next lap because he'd have been behind Lewis. So Mercedes just pretty much boxed that Red Bull into a corner and uh, waited for him to give up to the point where Max's tyres had gone off that much that it was like a uh, a bicycle versus a motorbike in the end. He just breezed past him and, um, yeah, that was race over. But Mercedes, fair play to them. They absolutely played a blinder with that uh, strategy, didn't they? They, um, they caught Red Bull out because I don't know if Red Bull expected it and it... Um, yeah, Red Bull just couldn't do anything about it. Yeah, and it was uh, harked back to what we saw from Schumacher, where he obviously he did the same thing, putting in about, what was it, like 18 or so laps worth of qualifying laps, and it's what Lewis did. He, he came out of the pit lane 19 seconds down on a brand new set of mediums. Obviously, Max is running around on the hard tyres, uh, getting towards the midpoint of their life, and then obviously getting older and older and older as the race went on. And you could see that that time was just coming down and down and down. And it was really impressive from Lewis. And he has his detractors and he has the that negative press behind him. And we see a lot of online toxicity behind his uh, people that don't particularly enjoy him. But he's he's he once again just showed what a magnificent driver he is. And congratulations, though, to, to Max. He, he took his first pole position, which is... Yeah ridiculous thought that he uh, he's done so yeah. well and he's yet to pick up a penalty a pole position um but and also makes it 100 different drivers in f1 history on pole position but yeah it was it was a real masterstroke from uh, from mercedes and, and james uh james over the radio and obviously he got up onto podium afterwards so yeah it's it was good to see because I think after we saw, we've had some really, really good races in Formula 1 and obviously we had that, that sort of lull after France and Canada where we had the issues and people saying oh, F1 is broken, F1 is broken. I think ever since then, you can't really complain. Although there's no. there's there's still uh, a problem, fundamental problem with Formula 1. We know that. We know there's three big teams and then he's got almost like a Formula 1.5 behind. We know that that's, that's an issue. But when it comes to on-track action, it's probably this is probably the most exciting we've seen it in several several seasons. Yeah, I agree. Um, that um, midfield battle, for example, is is fascinating. Um, we've seen McLaren, Alfa Romeo, Renault, but they've fallen back slightly just lately. 
tore off. So the, it's it's been a while, hasn't it, where you've had so many midfield teams all fighting each other. And now Red Bull, in recent races as well, getting amongst Mercedes and Ferrari. So it is really good to see instead of just one team out of the top three running away with it and being 40 seconds into the lead and everybody calling the race boring. It's We're getting interesting battles throughout the race. It's just such a shame. The only thing I found such a shame about the weekend was is the front-running guys were that f much faster that Carlos Sainz in P5 was lapped, which is just, for me, is just insane. Someone in P5 getting lapped is is uh, something you don't really hear too often. But, um, yeah, the racing, last few races have been fabulous. And you notice we've been to the classic tracks, so to speak, haven't we? And this is where we usually get the uh, the more exciting races. So... We're going up to Spa next, so hopefully this momentum of great races Formula 1's been going through at the minute will take it into Spa and we have an, another classic round there. Yeah, of course, one of the most iconic circuits. So l looking forward to that one after the summer break and the, uh, for sure the drivers will be enjoying this uh, slight recharge they get over the summer. And all we've been watching up with, uh, we catch up with Lando's Instagram is always a fun one to watch over this summer break. But yeah, uh, going back to what you were saying about the whole field being lapped and like, like you said, up to Carlos Sainz in fifth were lapped. Uh, once again, Pierre Gasly is lapped in, in the second Red Bull. But yeah. this it kind of this is what we saw in the 90s and 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 through sort of through many different eras of Formula One, we've seen sort of dominant teams. And but w what is it about these top four? The the sort of the two the two Ferraris Max and Lewis the and I mean you can probably put Valtteri in there obviously he had that issue that he probably wouldn't have been lapped if if he if it wasn't the case but what about it is it just purely on the pace or is is it something about the actual uh, the actual driver that kind of pushes them on a little bit further because what what has Max got with, underneath him that Pierre can't get. It, it, it's that difference. It, you comparing Max to Pierre, you just Max is that next level, isn't it? It's like Lewis and Valtteri. Lewis is that next level. You have good drivers, and Pierre is a good driver, and so is Valtteri. But then you go up that next step, don't you? And you can get these drivers. You can get three, four tenths out of a lap. What these drivers just simply can't have, even if they um, got the same power. It's it's uh, it shows how good these guys are, especially Max, because if, for example, that Honda-powered Red Bull is, is that's its limit, is what Pierre's giving it. It just shows you how much Max is doing well in that uh, car. But those three cars, I'd say, because of their resources and everything else, it, uh, it just, everything all kind of plays into hand. They've got the best drivers, they've got the best engineers, they've got all the best setups, everything like that. So it just all integrates into one, doesn't it, to, to push them that far ahead of the midfield. And unfortunately, uh, we like you mentioned, we do have that that gap, don't we, uh, where you have the Formula 1.5 for the rest. But uh, it'd be good if we can narrow it down and see Max fighting not only with Lewis, but with other people who are in the... the lower end of the grid as well and everybody getting a chance to fight for podiums that's when uh i think we'll get even better racing but it remains to be seen if formula one ever gets to that point it's um it's very um manufacturable isn't it at the minute yeah i think and we're still kind of living in that uh the blowback era from bernie eccleston where obviously the, the money is given out in a the wrong yeah. way really it's distributed obviously it favors the big team so it's it's really not going to help until we can get these new regs in and even then I, was, I mean i was saying in our previous podcasts that we've done i don't think even then i don't think it's going to make that much difference because until uh, the fia and, and liberty media kind of really detach the teams from the from any decisions then you're always going to have there's always going it's always going to work in the team's favor because obviously Mercedes and Ferrari will do their usual thing as oh if we don't get our own way we'll leave and uh, I don't know I can't, at, at times I'm like oh, go on then just go go produce an engine for uh, for IndyCar because IndyCar are changing their regulations in the early t uh, 2020s as well uh, to, in the hope of trying to bring in new engine supplies because at the moment they're only running Hondas and Chevrolets so um but that would give the opportunity to the likes of Porsche, BMW. We know there's there was rumblings of Ford maybe trying to come back at some point. So I think 
once once these new regs come in 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 the early 20s we can expect to hopefully see things change up a bit but uh, going back and, and and looking at sort of that uh, formula 1.5 that we were we were just saying that once again carlos science coming in fifth place i think that's consecutive races now for the mclaren yeah and yeah. he's he's re i mean i'm really impressed by carlos this season and there's definitely been a lot of talk about lando and how he's a breath of fresh air in formula one and, and the, his personality and his positivity but carlos is going very much under the radar at the moment is some he's only five points off for gasly in the in the drivers championship which considering he is in supposedly a car much much slower and we we've already seen the red bull pick up two race wins this season like the fact that carlos is able to almost overhaul pierre and and like like we uh like we were saying that Pierre, he's obviously struggling with it, and and I can see you talking to Nick, and Nick saying that he's read that Gasly can't handle the oversteer, but the fact that he's able to keep up with that Honda power in this McLaren is really showing yeah. just how impressive he's been this season. Oh, I agree. Um, Carlos Sainz, for me, you say he's he's, he's kind of gone under the radar, as he so to speak, because of all the. Uh... All the headlines Max has been creating and how well Lewis has done so far this season. Carlos has gone under the radar a bit and just got on with his job. That Lando, like you say, is a breath of fresh air, but Carlos is just getting getting on with it. Lando, just briefly, was really unlucky at the weekend with that just a sticky wheel gun on the right left, I think, uh, rear left of the car, and um, it just wouldn't get the wheel off. It, he would have probably finished up. Sixth or seventh, so that would have been even better for for McLaren. But yeah, Carlos Sainz, he, um, I think he's, I think he's benefit benefiting from the fact now that he's in a team that actually want him, and in a team that wants to put their arm around him and say, "You're our main driver now. We want you to, we want you to uh, go and deliver us." The points everywhere he's been really he's been like like past the parcel hasn't he where he's been he's never really had time to sit down and settle into into the team he's at and um now mclaren are, are getting the benefit of uh what carlos Sainz can produce and hopefully for his sake and the team's sake they can carry this on they, there's uh the team of this week recently said they're targeting uh, Pierre Gasly for uh, Science to beat, which if they do manage that, like you say, in, in a Red Bull car, which has won two races this season, that would be a, a pretty huge achievement if cars can do that. Yeah, big time. I've been really impressed and we'll get on to it a bit later. We've got a discussion piece about underrated drivers and I'm, I can we can probably guess who uh, is going to be both of our <laughs> number ones at the moment. So, uh, yeah, really, really enjoyed Carlos. I, I really enjoy listening to him on the radio. He's obviously enjoying his racing at the moment, which is yeah. what you like to hear from the drivers because you can hear the likes of uh, Charles where he just, he sounds like he's just, every time he's on the radio, he just sounds like he's under pressure. Or, and, and we know that he's he's very self-critical. He, he puts a lot of pressure on himself. You've heard that when he made mistakes in Baku. You heard that when he made that mistake in Germany and, and hit the wall. And... Um, he he was involved in a, a fun little battle with with Vettel and Vettel doing the same as as what Hamilton Hamilton did and and were having those fresher tyres at the end managed to overhaul Charles with I think two laps left to go, but yeah. I mean the Ferraris were nowhere at the weekend and no. what was what was so wrong with Ferrari because it, it's it's never been a circuit they've really struggled at hugely but they were way off the pace last weekend. It was like they built a car specifically just for the straights, because um, what in practice at qualifying they were always the fastest or near the fastest in sector one. But as soon as it went into the twisty sections, it was absolutely nowhere. It was it was weird. There was over 40. I'm sure there was over 40 seconds off uh, Max and Lewis, which for Ferrari that's kind of embarrassing, really, isn't it? You don't want you don't want to be running third or fourth or wherever in the first place if you're Ferrari. You want to be on that top step, but to be running third, fourth, and and then also being 40 plus seconds behind is really embarrassing. And it's a race they really want to forget about and we'll try and work out why. I could not understand. It's obviously that that, that car. It just cannot take those twisty sections of the uh, Hungarian track. It was very bizarre it's just like they were having a race on their own really wasn't it because you had the max and lewis fighting out then you had them two and then you had another big gap back to 
uh, Carlos and uh, Pierre and what have you. It was it was a very bizarre weekend for for Ferrari. They'll probably say they're happy because they got a podium, but um, you can't be happy with that, surely. If you if you're a Ferrari fan or if you work for Ferrari, surely you can't be happy to see your team that far off the pace uh, at that race. No, well they were well off, and I was I was really disappointed with, with Ferrari this weekend. I think. Yes, the the sort of the fight from Vettel to overhaul Charles at the end was was interesting, but I think I don't know. You you, you could hear that Vettel was happy. I think that he knew that was probably the best they could do. Yeah. Um, but even still, it's and I think it's funny because the you, you can see uh, they're fighting. It's Ferrari fighting against Red Bull now for the constructors. Mercedes have gone. This it's yeah. champ, constructors championship is over pretty. much at the halfway stage Lewis has already got eight eight wins so far this season I think it is which is three more than he's ever had so far at the halfway stage in the season and uh and Ferrari are by uh by themselves are in a what seems to be it seems to be like a uh, a little mini battle with Max Verstappen who seems to be dragging Red Bull into this this fight for second place in the constructors, and I think it's what Christine Horner was saying at the weekend, is that they need they need Pierre to pick up the pace because yeah. the fight is with Ferrari at the moment. But you, I mean, it's crazy because we we saw at the start of the season in pre season and and in the first two races that we thought our oh, Ferrari going to go up against we thought they're going to go up against Mercedes, they're going to give them a run for, run for their money. Of course, Charles had that uh, power issue at Bahrain that dropped him from what was probably the race win. Yeah. And um, but yeah, they just it was I don't know whether the track just didn't suit them. Uh, Belgium and Italy the next two races up, so very much power circuits. Obviously, nice long straight from the exit of La Source all the way down to uh, the end of the Kemmel Straight in Belgium, and then Italy, of course, is pretty much three straights yeah. with a couple of corners in <laughs> in between. But um, so hopefully they kind of come back into their own because I would like to see I'd love to see Charles get get that win I think he needs it to kind of take the edge off a, a stressful season and but then equally it's, I don't know is is Seb is he still kind of enthused in this championship knowing how far off, off the like the back of Lewis he is it's tough isn't it as a four time world champion you don't ever want to be that far off the pace do you it's um it's tough to work out what Ferrari do next. Do they just give up on this season? What would you do? Would you would you, would you give up on this season now and try and focus on making sure that next year's cars work correctly, or do you try and salvage it somehow? Because I don't know how they'd go about the rest of the season. Because the longer this goes on, it should, I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel for this season for Ferrari. It'd be amazing if. if Especially like you mentioned earlier, they, how good they looked at the, uh, in pre-season. It'd be amazing to say that they, if they went on and didn't win a race this year, that'd be incredible because you'd have had money, uh, money on uh, them winning the championship. Probably it's um, it's bizarre. How how would you go about it if you were a Ferrari fan, for example? What would you want Ferrari to do? Would you want them to try and stick it out and see see what they can do with this car? Or would you prefer them to just to uh, like rip the book up so to speak and focus on next year see I, I don't think that you can look at next year because it's almost like we know that we're coming to the end of this sort of era as regulations is that what are you going to do you're going to put a load of resource into a car that's only going to run for a year and then potentially be com completely changed do they do they give up on a championship to really throw it in for a, a one season wonder and just hope to kind of break that duck that we've seen from Ferrari ever that's the what was it Kimi was the last Ferrari world champion yeah. yeah so it's I don't know it's it's tricky isn't it but then but then what is what is the major problem at Ferrari at the, at the moment because is it the drivers is it is is there a, a clash of styles because obviously you've got a, a very young promising driver in Charles Leclerc who is or should be a future multi-time world champion. You've got a multi, you've got a four-time world champion there already, but seems to be losing a little bit of enthusiasm. Whilst, or maybe it's just frustration, or is it the fact that we've seen them make some dreadful strategy choices this season? Oh and God! They've just yeah. it's it's been a whole season of of errors at all stages. We've seen 
it's and you can't put it down to one thing. You've seen the drivers make mistakes. We've seen Seb and Charles make mistakes on track, but then equally, they've both been played bad hands. Charles probably more than Seb, but yeah, the strategy is is equally just kind of held them back. So, where what is the major issue for Ferrari? Because where where do you focus if you've got so many problems going on within your uh, your organization? That is, that is that is totally true. I just don't know. I I wouldn't have a clue. That's that's why these guys probably get paid more than me. They can work it out. I just I do they just do a a whole reset on it? And I've seen the comments. Nick agrees with me, um, saying that they should throw everything at throw everything at next season. And why why not? Even if the regs do change in 2021, why not just have a go at it? It's crazy. It, I find it still amazing to say that. Ferrari last won a championship in 2007. That is just baffling, isn't it? For a team like Ferrari, who have run, especially the last few years, who've run Mercedes very close, you'd think from then till now they'd have won at least one more. It's 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 something long term clearly is wrong at Ferrari. I don't know what that could be, but you talk about strategies and calls it makes me laugh i don't know about you but it makes me laugh when you hear the radio come up and they go plan b or plan c and we heard plan s at one point and you're thinking how many plans they, they must have a, a whole folder full of different plans just for one race and they just come up with different plans plan g plan h and you're thinking wow are they really struggling that much that they have to go this far down the alphabet to to work out a plan it's it's all very bizarre at Ferrari, and for the sake of uh, F1, really, uh, it, I just would like Ferrari to just get their act together so Mercedes aren't just running away with it like they are at the minute. It, um, it would make a refreshing change. Yeah, yeah you, you're totally right. And I mean, I've never been a Ferrari fan. I can I can never say that I've wanted Ferrari to do well. Um, I've always, uh, I grew up not well i say despising i never wanted schumacher to win i kind of grew up for that era where he just dominated so um but yeah you get to a stage now where you you want to see competition you want to see mercedes kind of be challenged and and yeah as nick said he feels like they ferrari feel like they're under too much pressure from mercedes which is they're trying too hard and making mistakes and they, it's kind of yeah. right the fact that yeah. red bull and red, red bull Really, at the end of sort of their their Renault tenure, were nowhere, and they've they've taken on an engine supplier that was seen as notoriously un un uh, sort of uh, unreliable, and we saw how many issues that they had at, at, at McLaren when they first joined back in Formula One, but then equally Toro Rosso had terrible issues last season. They their power units were failing every other race, but they've managed to lock it in and. Red Bull have always got good strategy. They always seem yeah. to work it. I mean, this this weekend was seemed to be the first weekend in a long time that they've really kind of dropped the ball. Um, as soon as Lewis came in, they should have boxed Max. And as, I mean, they left him out for two laps, and once those two laps had gone, he'd already cut down that that undercut gap, and he got within within striking distance of getting past Max. So the, the game was over then. It was just a case of Lewis having to close that gap, but. Yeah, it's it's a real it's going to be a really sort of interesting sort of second half of the seasons for for, for Ferrari because they've got a lot of work to do to kind of gain a lot of trust back. And and I'm I've said before I'm I'm heading to the Italian Grand Prix in a couple of weeks' time, and it's going to be really interesting to see sort of like the the reaction of the Tifosi, and especially if yeah. you see Mercedes or Red Bull win there because. Yeah, with Ferrari, with what they claim to be the car, the str like the fastest car in a straight line, they should win. But it's almost like they will find a way to sabotage themselves. Yeah, and you talk about pressure from Mercedes. Imagine the pressure from the Tifosi at um, Monza. You're not only going to have probably one of the fastest cars in the straight, but if they don't come out with a win and they're that far off the pace like they were in Hungary. There's going to be riots in the grandstand, isn't there? Because the Ferrari fans, they definitely um, let their voices be heard when when they're not happy with things at Ferrari. And if if you get a Mercedes one two and and maybe a Max on the podium as well, and Ferrari are, are down in fourth and fifth or worse, 
it's uh, I, I don't envy you going to that race. I'll be honest. If it, if that's the case, because it'd be bedlam there. But um, like you say, with Monza being pretty much a straight track, apart from a few corners, you would imagine Ferrari would take the win, wouldn't you? But with the pressure of pressure of thinking that and the pressure of the home support, it's it's um, it's going to be remain to be seen if they can manage it. And I I I'm skeptical. I don't think they can win at Monza this year and they haven't shown me any reason why they can really apart from it can go fast sometimes in a straight yeah yeah I totally agree um I think it's going to be a really interesting race and uh it will be it will be cool to watch them win there but um I I don't know at the moment I can't see it happening and uh I can't see them unless something happens sort of to Mercedes and Red Bull at the moment I can't see either Seb or Charles kind of overhauling Max and Lewis because those two seem to be on a completely another level at the moment. And then equally, I mean, Seb's having his own issues in qualifying. He can't he can't seem to qualify higher than fifth at the moment. He just he's been struggling. I, I think it's over the last six races or so. He's only qualified inside the top five once or twice. It's it's crazy yeah. from from he's been well off the ball, but. Looking, uh, obviously, that's a lot of cars at the front end. And just quickly before we move on to the sort of the next section, I just want to highlight, and he's going to be another one of the drivers I'm going to put into the next section. Is what a fantastic race from George Russell. Um, yes. And there's a lot of talk with who should replace or who may replace Bottas at Mercedes. Obviously, a lot of talk about Ocon. Uh, George Russell is still is is part of the Mercedes Young Driver program. Qualifies in fifteenth just just missed out on getting into q2 by half a tenth and uh just uh in in the race he hit a fantastic start got past two drivers he's actually up to 13th by the end of the first lap F uh, comes in 16th uh drops back a little bit after a couple of the faster drivers kind of managed to make their way back through but i die it was a fantastic race from him and that that was i think what people wanted to see because people know that he's got talent we've seen that he's been a champion yeah. in in gp3 he's been champion in f in f2 um and it really uh, I, although there's been there's obviously been a lot of talk about sort of his rivalry of kibitza and it's kind of them versus each other this season because they've not been close enough to anyone but he really really showed up uh the pole this this weekend because not only did he out qualify him by almost a second and a half in the race, he just he just drove away from him. Yeah, it's um, it. This was the perfect race for George Russell uh, to show everybody that um, how much better he is than Kubica, despite Kubica just picking up that point, which is. That still frustrates me, but George Russell uh, qualifying. I even, I even found myself cheering George Russell on at the end there. He um, at the end of Q1 there. I thought he was just going to sneak, sneak it through, and that had been some achievement in that car. They did bring a lot of upgrades, didn't they, to uh, to the weekend, and obviously that has helped George massively. Um, George has just got to keep doing what he is he is doing, showing that he. He can uh, can beat his teammate, and anything like what he's doing, uh, just done it hungry. He um, he's only going to um, make his name even bigger. I don't think he's quite ready for Mercedes yet, personally. I think he needs another year, maybe with Williams, just to just to keep uh, keep his uh, momentum going with Williams. You don't want to throw all that pressure, I'd say, too much too soon on George, especially if he's going up against Lewis. That's um, Nobody really wants to go up against a red hot Lewis in a Mercedes, do they? But George, yeah, he's he's definitely doing well, and he's he, for me he's he's going to be in Formula One for a very long time. He proved how well he is, how well he's doing at Williams, and if Williams can give him a competitive car next year, fingers crossed for them, then we might see George Russell uh, fighting for points, and then we can really see what sort of talent he's uh, got behind that wheel. Yeah, I'm really, really happy for him because uh, I've I've kind of watched him throughout his, a lot of his junior career. I love watching the junior formulas and he's been really good, consummate professional. Re does, of course, this season he's kind of been overshadowed by the likes of Alex and Lando because of their performances. Yeah. But he's, but if if you had a camera on him, he's been superb in the races, superb in qualifying. 
he's brilliant with media i think he he really has done very well and but then equally i'm i'm really happy for for williams i'm glad that they this has been they obviously they got that point slightly fortuitously because of alpha's uh alpha's demotion but then equally to bring these these uh these bits of up- upgrades to Hungary and come away with, with almost a Q2. It'll be a huge boost for them. And I, I mean, I live just down the road from Grove and their home base. And so, and I've always had a soft, soft, soft spot for, for Williams. I was a, a diehard Damon Hill fan back in the nineties. So it was, uh, it's always nice to see them kind of getting back to a position where they can start to challenge um, because you you want to see it and not just because they're one of those sort of iconic manufacturers but because you want to you want to be able to see drivers you don't want to see these sort of ridiculous 3.5 seconds off the pole position you want to see like a top 20 that are maybe split by a second a second and a half max at, at some tracks it's and uh williams they started off on on the back foot so much it's it, it was it was really nice and uh i'm sure the Although they obviously didn't come away with anything, I'm sure they leave Hungary and going into the going into the off or into the off season with a little bit of a a little bit of a boost in confidence. Although it's a very downforce heavy circuit, Hungary. We're now going to Belgium and Italy, so it might be two races they may struggle at. Um, but then we've got Singapore after that. So yeah, maybe in Singapore we might see if George can lock it in once again. We might see Williams maybe sneak into Q2 because that's definitely I imagine what their goal is for the season. Oh definitely. If they can if they can end the season qualifying in Q two then they've done one hell of a, an achievement, haven't they? Because like you say how far they was was off of pole position, never mind uh, getting into getting into Q two. But if they can start uh, get towards the end of the season qualifying uh, into Q two and maybe challenging like 13th and 14th place, yes, it's not points, but where they were, if they were challenging 13th and 14th in the race, that for me would be a, a big achievement, and it will show that uh, their hard work that they've done over the season has really paid off, because they have started so far off the back foot, it's it's been such a tough ask, you, you get, you get, you started to worry about Williams, didn't you, at one point, because they were that far off. You're thinking, are they actually going to struggle to uh, stay on the grid because of uh, they could end up losing sponsors and people uh, people working in the team. But they've, they've shown real grit, haven't they, and real determination because I wouldn't like to have been in that team at the beginning of the season. You imagine the amount of hard work they'll have needed to do just to be able to be able to do what George Russell did in Hungary. So yeah, hat, hat off to them. They are they are slowly starting to turn it, and fingers crossed for them. They can um, they can push Q2 towards the end of the season. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully, Williams made their way back or signed that new deal with Rocket. So a uh, nice bit of sponsorship money will be consistent over them for the next few years. But now going on to what I mean, we're talking about. <coughs> we kind of briefly touched on it when we were talking about George Russell and Carlos Sainz and it's underrated drivers on the F1 grid and um, I imagine they might make it into your top three have, have you got anyone else or would you like to highlight any drivers that you think on the F1 grid at the moment that you think are underrated or sort of undervalued um, at the beginning of the season I'd have probably put Kvyat in there people were people are uh, obviously more aware of how Kvyat is doing now, and he's doing very well. But at the beginning of the season, you'd have probably said uh, his name because you didn't know how he was going to do coming back to Red Bull again. Uh, well, the Red Bull brand again, I should say. And um, you didn't think uh, he would be able to be able to get back up to speed. We know he's got the pace because he's been on podiums with with Red Bull, so you know he's got it. But to to pick up that podium with Toro Rosso in in Germany, um, he's done really well, and like with Alex alongside him, they've they've turned out to be a hand, handy little team this season, Toros. So they've they've shown they can work well together. And uh, uh, the Hungarian Grand Prix last weekend, that battle with them when they were side by side, that was a super, superb battle. And I think Haas should look back on 
on that uh, little replay of them battling and show it that they can fight each other and they don't have to run into each other. Them two, especially. I, I, you, you mentioned Carl Sainz, but I have to highlight, and George Russell, I have to highlight the Toro Rosso boys because I think them two as a pair, I didn't think much of it when I first looked at it, but they've they've surprised me a lot and they've done really well. Yeah, yeah, massively agree. I think the, I think it's the strongest lineup to Rosso have had, um, probably in their since their inception. Um, I think coming in, I think people weren't quite sure. There was a lot of when Kvyat signed again, they were like, "Oh, why, what is he doing? Come back into Formula One?" He'd gone off, he'd gone off and uh, become a Ferrari sim driver for a bit. He's come back in, and yeah, you, I mean, it was a topsy turvy race because of the conditions, but a fully deserved podium um, out of it because he drove superbly and uh, yeah so Danny was delighted with that one but then equally I think Alex has done a, a magnificent job since he came in unfortunately he's not picked up the same points that Kvyat has because he's obviously had issues uh, a lot of um, sort of power unit and power train issues as well That so you had the likes of him starting from the pit lane in China and coming through and getting points so and bear in mind, this is a driver that was dropped by the Red Bull program three years previously and was signed up to drive for, I think it was, I think he was signed up to drive for Nis, or Nissan's uh, uh, Formula E team this season until about three week, three or so weeks before the start, yeah. start of, or before pre-season. And then obviously managed to take that seat because uh, Brendan Hartley uh, leaving. So... I think both of them have come in and done a, a sterling job and I think Toro Rosso and Franz Toss would be delighted with what they've done so far. And yeah, like you said, that, that battle they had around the uh, from the first corner all the way around to turn four and turn five was was brilliant. And yeah, Hash should look at it and, and kind of say to their drivers, why can't you do that? And unfortunately, I mean, we've talked about it before that I think the breakdown in, in relationship between Grosjean and Magnussen is pretty much at its lowest it's almost uh lewis and nico-esque now where they just don't trust each other and i imagine they're not in particularly good terms off track either so but yeah, with underrated it's not just an underrated uh underrated kind of dr driver it's drivers and an entire team so tor rosso are sitting on a little bit of a gold mine there at the moment with uh sort of confidence and much like we've seen from mclaren i think both their drivers are pretty happy with how the season's going I and mean, that's only gonna really benefit and j just adding uh before uh, we've got obviously two glaring uh glaring people to talk about when it comes to underrated drivers in in first and second but just want to drop in i just like to say that i think kimi raikkonen has been underrated this season he has been brilliant and he's really yeah. really shone since moving i think people thought as soon as he moved to alpha this is the twilight of his career he could he have re retired and just kind of let someone else come into the seat but he's consistently ch challenging in qualifying he's being he's getting decent points i think he's sitting sixth maybe seventh in the championship and he's really showing up giovanazzi so um it's not doing geo all that uh all that sort of positive uh, at the moment because obviously you don't want to be shown up too much by your by your much older and experienced teammate as we saw with van dorn and alonso and uh but yeah kimmy i don't know about you but i think he's kind of gone under the radar but picked up some really solid like we've we saw in, in germany he was running running in the top i think top four at the start, top three maybe yeah, yeah, Kimmy, uh, that is a good chat actually. Kimmy has, he's had a very good season. Uh, I personally, I'll, I'll be on, uh, on the same bus as most people. I I reckon Kimmy was just going to go to Alpha and and pick up his paycheck and you, and you might see him the odd time in, in uh, the top 10 and that was about it. He was pretty much on his drive to retire. But um, yeah, Kimmy's been superb. He was battling this weekend, wasn't he, with... Uh, Carlos Pierre and uh, and uh, the the lights around there for P5. So yeah, he's done he's done well, Kimmy. He's um he's he's still got a few tricks up his sleeve, hasn't he? Um, he's, 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 if it weren't for Kimmy, really, Alpha would be in a lot worse place than they are right now. Because I think he's got has he got all of their points or like ninety percent of their points. So yes, um. Kimmy being Kimmy, really, isn't it? We, sh we shouldn't be surprised he's doing well, but this is Kimmy, isn't it? <laughs> no, exactly. He's he's. Uh, I think he's gone to a position now where 
he's not he's not he's he's not that wingman like he was at Ferrari. He's not expected to kind of just roll over like he was for Seb. So uh, it would it's uh, I think it's definitely benefited him. And equally, he he kind of I imagine he just enjoys that it's a lot more chilled out. It suits his personality. It suits the way he drives and. It's uh, it's fun having him on the grid because he, he does uh, he is one of those characters that it's just like it's always nice having someone like him around. He's not quite that sort of Alonso esque where Alonso was, as we we've kind of talked about before, very serious, very um, very derogatory about the cars if something was going wrong. He he's very much the opposite. He'd get frustrated, but then he'll just brush it off and. Uh, and just make a, a snarky comment that will just make people laugh. So, yeah, it will be a shame when we unfortunately lose Kimmy. But uh, I'm glad to see that he's doing well. But, yeah, just topping off with the uh, the top two. And it's obviously, once again, it's Carlos Sainz and George Russell. Who between the two would you say has been the most underrated or has performed above and beyond where you thought this season out of those two? Um, I'm trying not to be biased now. <laughs> <laughs> but... I probably will go with Carlos just because he's got he's got McLaren results this year that I didn't expect really. I thought I said at the beginning of the season that it'd be McLaren, Renault, and possibly Haas fighting for that fourth place in the championship. How wrong I've been, um, and Carlos is is. He's had a lot of. I think the best thing about it is because he's he's having a lot of fun and he's enjoying his environment at, uh, at McLaren now. He's he's really showing why he was in the Red Bull program. And um, it's and one question I've been asking recently is I wonder if Red Bull regret letting him go. You know because he he's looking that good at me. It'd be interesting to see what he could do in, if he was in place of Gasly in that Red Bull. He's he's looked very settled. You can't. Obviously, push aside George. George has been superb, but I just think because I think Carlos has picked up these these fifth places, especially in places Hungary was. I don't know if you're aware, but Hungary was deemed as one of McLaren's weakest tracks, and he come out with a P5. It's one of their weakest tracks. Just shows how well he's done this season. And um, yeah, he's been a bit fortunate in places, but he's also been a bit unfortunate at the beginning of the season. So he's. Um, yeah, for me, it's it's Carlos just because of where he's where he's put the car and and how much points he's actually scored this first half of the season. Not the fact that he wears orange and blue. Um, papaya and blue. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, like we said at the start, I, it's hard to disagree with that. I I think Carlos is is but he's had a fantastic season. He um he's really sort of. You can see that he's he's really enjoying his racing. He's very much his his dynamic that he's got with Lando is brilliant. I think Lando's been very unfortunate. I probably put uh, I don't know I I don't think Lando's un, underrated though. I think people know no. that he's a uh, he's yeah. a lightning in a bottle. He's just unfortunately had a couple of uh, of issues yeah. with the car. Well, I, I think the only mistake he's made so far this season was that incident he had with Lance Stroll in Spain, and even then I think it was probably a fifty fifty crash. I don't think it was Lando's fault entirely he's obviously had uh had slow pit stops in the, in the last few races he had the issue in germany but yeah i think carlos is uh you can tell on the radio just how much fun he's having and it's definitely more this isn't the the carlos that we saw uh at renault last season it's definitely not the no. carlos that we saw getting frustrated as a teammate of max verstappen at toro rosso so it's uh it's really good to see but yeah on the flip side looking at george russell George consistently outpacing his quality is uh, is much more experienced. Although yeah. obviously Robert's got his issues with obviously with his injuries come back from from and and yes, it's uh, very impressive he has managed to get a seat. But I think I don't know whether it was the wisest of decisions for for Williams to do so. But he has consistently been in qualifying pretty much in the races. Obviously he he, he hasn't got that that point that he probably deserves but yeah it's it will be interesting to see what happens to George at the end of the season because I think I don't know I and I saw uh I saw Nick talking about it earlier about the fact that he wasn't quite sure 
what he thought that he thought that Ocon is overrated and I tend to agree I don't think I think George Russell is a better bet than Ocon so if they place Bottas I would put George there I don't I don't see the difference between Bot uh, between Ocon and Russell being any bigger and and what are you going to do you're going to you're going to replace if they are going to replace Bottas which is looking more likely than not at the moment are you going to put in a, a driver that's been sitting on the sidelines for a season or are you going to put in a driver that although yes he's not got as much experience he has already shown that he's willing to kind of he kind of take that fight and and get the best out of a bad situation as what he's got at Williams but then equally like yes it, it would be tricky going into a team with Lewis but he he can either see it from one of two ways you can do a you can do a stopple van door and just kind of get battered into submission and just completely losing your confidence or do the complete opposite who who is more perfect to learn off than what will probably go down as one of the greatest F1 drivers of all time. And if that's your teammate and you get, what, a season, maybe two seasons of Lewis being alongside you, if I was George Russell, I would be trying to grab that with both hands and saying to Mercedes, look, put me in that seat. I will, I will, Lewis is my mentor. And for the next five seasons after that, I'll win you another five championships. Yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? I, um... <sighs> I'd like to see George up against Lewis. I, I, me personally, I, I just think, I, I, I like. I'll say now, I like Espen Ocon. I think yes, he had his issues forcing it. I do think he, he is fast, and I can't see him being any worse than what Valtteri Bottas has been. I'm not saying Bottas has been bad. I'm just saying he's. Is uh, he can't do any worse than that, and I think what they'll probably do, Mercedes, is probably give Esteban a, a one year contract and say, Look, do what you can, and if not, we're going to replace you with George. And then th this time next season, you might see then George going into that seat for the brand new regulations in 2021. Because I think at a minute, I think they're happy with how George is is progressing at Williams and if Williams can give him a better car he can only progress more and, and and mature more at Williams knowing how to fight through a field and knowing how to fight with other people around him rather than just sticking with a car straight away that's always at the front always winning always this I'm not saying he's a bad driver or anything I'm not saying he can't overtake but it just I think it it'll help evolve his whole racecraft if he can stick with a team like Williams who are prepared to fight amongst the middle at the minute and then eventually for the 2021 regulations when it all does change then that's when I would then put George Russell in when it's all changed when he's when he's got two years of F1 under his belt then he can really go for it that's how I would do it but um, I could totally see your point as well yeah we'll see it be interesting for Mercedes do they do a, a Ferrari what obviously what we saw Charles Leclerc do one season and we've got Mick Schumacher, who won a race in the first race in F2 and uh, stood on the top step in Hungary. So uh, I would imagine Alpha will be looking at him as well. So there's plenty of uh, yeah. very young and uh, promising drivers coming up. And I think at the moment, I think Mick Schumacher, I think he's still got another another season in F2. I don't think he's ready yeah. to come up just yet. But I think uh, with George possibly going up to a top team, I think... Ferrari, their long game is definitely to have Mick Schumacher sitting in that car as well. Um, yeah. And then equally, you've got Max Verstappen and Lando Norris. I think that, yeah, next 10 years of Formula 1 is going to be pretty good, hopefully, um, if we can see these drivers continue progressing. But uh, one thing I was impressed with, George, and, and it kind of draws us on to the next, the next point, and uh, I'll, I'll let you kind of take the lead on this because I, I enjoyed you kind of talking about it on Monday when we were talking about this. That, uh, we missed quite a lot on on over the weekend when it comes to TV coverage. There was a lot of uh, a lot of things that happened on the circuit. George Russell had a great start, dropped back, but then made t two brilliant moves on the opening lap um, opening laps and made made up those positions 13th. We also then missed a, a large point, a, a large portion of uh, Carlos Sainz and his battle with Pierre Gasly. F1 TV and its coverage. Have you have you got an issue with with how they how they kind of show the TV, whether it's like how, how it's presented? 
I find it incredibly frustrating because you've got somebody like Daniel Ricciardo who's who's known for his his ambitious overtakes and his his rough style driving and everything else. And then you've got Kevin Magnussen who's very much the same. And because because they're fighting in 13th and 14th or whatever they was at the time, let's let's focus on that for six seven laps. Why? Why are we looking at that? I don't. I understand that Dan might have a lot of fans. That's fair enough. But you've got a you've got a, a guy in Carlos Sainz who is arguably in a position he shouldn't be in in P P5. He's got Pierre Gasly right behind him. For the most of the like 10 15 laps, I was sat watching the the uh, timing on the left hand side because just to keep an eye on that Carlos was still there. But that's all I had to go on. And it's frustrating because within those laps, Gasly was, what, five tenths, six tenths behind Carlos all the time. And I just personally wanted to know how Carlos was defending that because you see him back at Silverstone where they did show some of Carlos's battles with Dan. And I think that's all the reason why he got some of that because it was Dan. And you've seen how Carlos was defending the DRS zones against Dan, so he couldn't get his his dive, uh, dives down the inside like like he likes to do. And it, it just frustrates me because I would like to know what Carlos was doing to keep a, a, an obvious faster car behind him for that long period of time. And there's like you've pointed out, there's other periods of the race that we didn't really see. And the only real chance, I don't know about yourself, but the only real chance you ever get to see clips that you don't see now is when people um, screen grab off F1 TV and post them on Twitter. And you're like, oh, that's what that's happened. And it should be like that. You should be finding really good bits through what people have got um, off a stream or, or elsewhere and putting it on Twitter or, or social media. These, these bits should be put live on our TV. I don't understand why we're missing out on it. It's just stuff like, yeah, yeah, Daniel Ricciardo's fant fantastic at overtaking, but we don't need to see a fight for 14th and 13th place. It's not going to score any points. You've got a good position P5. And yeah, and not only that, you had Kimi Raikkonen, what, 1.5 seconds behind them two. So it's not exactly like uh, it was a boring battle. There was clearly a, a battle of strategy there. Like we've said before, this race was a battle of strategy, and I don't understand. It frustrates me because... It's clearly not Sky who's running the different um, angles and what we're watching next. It's obviously the uh, the broadcasters F1, and I don't. I put, I'd like to know your opinion. I just don't understand why we need to watch specific drivers, even if they're way out of position. Because Dan, let's face it, all weekend. That Renault was really poor. He, he was he was way out of it in qualifying. Yeah, he had that issue. Uh, with Perez, but he was way out of in qualifying, and he never really did anything in the race, and neither did Nico Hulkenberg. So I don't understand why we are focusing on Renaults when we've got better battles further up the field. Yeah, I think it is. This season has been a strange one for TV coverage, and um, I'm not quite sure. I I watched it on Sky F1. Um, yeah, but. I know people kind of some people prefer the Channel Four commentary. I I actually quite like Crofty and Martin Brando. I I haven't got an issue with with se several people seem to have an issue with it. But I think um, I'm sure you'll agree it's not easy to be a commentator. And uh, no. So and it is very easy to kind of lose track with what you're saying. And we and Crofty tends to do that every now and then gets things wrong and people chastise him for it. But I having done it on a very small scale compared to how he does it i can completely sympathize it's very hard to talk non-stop i did my first 100 percent commentary uh at the end of last year and uh or last uh, last game year and it was incredibly hard to talk for an hour and a half and so uh but if, even the commentary aside, with the, with the TV, we've seen it's been very strange this season. We've seen a lot of. I mean, the first few races, and I I know race for race, you get you you have different TV productions. You do have um, F1 sort of running the show, and Liberty, obviously, but you do have you bring in cameramen usually um, from local areas as well which may be why we saw such shaky camera work. But, I mean, do you remember watching back in, I think it was China, 
and it was almost like you're watching the race at sometimes at an angle because the camera was either shaking or or was violently being like moved from side to side to try and catch up with cars and it's i don't know i, I don't i'm not quite sure I, i've i've not enjoyed um the sort of the tv coverage i i understand there's the uh, the contract in place for equal um equal opportunities so every every car or every uh, team has meant to have a certain amount of time during a race that it's on on the uh, camera that doesn't mean every driver so you that might mean you get 80 percent max verstappen only 20 percent pierre gasly and that's fair depending on what's happening on track but we are yeah. missing a lot of stuff we are missing a lot of uh a lot of sort of these on-track battles but i don't I, where, where do you how do you fix it do do sky f1 look at doing something i mean it'll be it would be incredibly i don't know if it would even be difficult it's, it's almost like the red button if that makes sense so we, yeah. we know with, with football with the red button you you can go and you can go and choose a game that you want to watch if there's multiple games on especially when they were doing it when it's european football could they do that with Formula One? Could it could it be like Formula One TV or F1 TV? Could you uh, still have the commentary of Martin Brundle and and, uh, and Crofty, but you could be sitting on board with whatever driver you want? I don't I don't because yeah. obviously then that satisfies that would satisfy you wanting to see a certain battle, and then you could yeah. always go you could flick back to they'd obviously have main coverage where it would be as as you'd watch usually but or you could go sit on board with i don't know six or seven different cars a race i it's it's f1 tv is a very good concept and the fact that it's not available in england is very irritating yes. <laughs> but obviously yes, that's okay. that's a uh, sky with uh, monopolizing pretty much as much as they can so uh, we'll thank bernie for that one but um it's it's yeah I don't, I don't know how because i don't know how they fix this because i think the the tv coverage this season has been much poorer than what we've seen graphically very good can't can't fault the uh the presentation and the pre-race graphics really enjoy it i think it's a much better upgrade i think liberty have done wonders for presentations since they joined camera work and production uh when it comes to actually producing the the stream i think it's been almost substandard in some races yeah I, I i tend to agree um the only thing i find frustrating I, i'd like to know your opinion the only thing i find frustrating what sky does in particular is when they do that split screen just to show you a driver interview we don't need to see the person being interviewed during the race or qualifying that's you only have to hear their voice you don't need to hear, see them so you, you end up only seeing half of what watch because you're watching half of a driver just being interviewed that just frustrates the hell out of me i've seen I, i've seen on motor gp they, they do picture in picture and i don't understand why sky or f1 can't do the same it it frustrates me at times because picture uh, sp split screening is just you, you don't get the best of anything then you, you get in less of both products and it just that that frustrates me the most with Sky is their their split screening because you don't like I say you don't need to see a driver being interviewed you can just listen to it you you would li like like this you, you you listen to us you don't need to watch us talking dear and that that's the same point there it just annoys the hell out of me let's just watch what's happening out on track and let's listen to what they're saying over the top of it why do we need to see it yeah and and, and I think there just needs to be a little bit of uh... I don't know variety we do see a lot of times where we kind of sit on board with with it maybe a max and he's ch he's chasing down lewis but you know if he's two or, or uh, hypothetically he's 2.7 seconds he is he is getting closer and he is getting done but you know there's not going to be a huge he's not going to catch up a second and a half in one lap in, unless lewis makes a mistake so there's no point being on board of him for that entire time you could or you could as you say go split screen and look at something else or highlight that something else is going on or you can i'm sure that the commentary team can have a split screen themselves and they can keep an eye on that battle for might be going on between max and lewis but then be watching something that's going on because we there's so many there's so many things that we've been put on like the f1 youtube channel 
or F1 Twitter and Instagram after the race. It's like, oh, look at this battle that happened that you didn't get to see. Yeah. And it's like, and it's like, yeah. it's such, it, it's such a frustrate, like, it's just like, it's such frustrating, like, that you, you get all of this. Oh, look at this, guys. We 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 miss this, and and it's you're like, you shouldn't be missing this because we've no. already we've watched videos, and um, there was a fascinating video at the end of last season. It was the production truck. And it telling, uh, I believe it was the one in Germany when Seb crashed out, and you can hear them working, and it's it's fascinating because you can it's a, a well-oiled machine, but they they have access to F1 TV, they they have access to every camera on the circuit. They see when all these fantastic moves are happening, but you don't get to see them, and you don't even get to see them as replays, which I think is the, the weirdest mm. thing. Is that you, there's not even yeah. like a Oh, there was that. There was that move from Kevin Magnussen on, on, uh, on Giovinazzi. Here, let's watch it back. It's completely glossed over, and we don't get to see it until after yeah. the race. But yeah, it's yeah, it's it's a. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how they fix it. I think if if we do get F1 TV allowed in the UK in uh, in the future, maybe that will change it. Um, I would like to see if Sky F1 continue as they do to have a sort of split split screen like F1 TV. I think it. I think the fans would appreciate it because I'd imagine that you would you'd like to start start a race by. Although it's it's fun to watch it, I imagine you'd like to sit on board of a driver and and sort of watch their yeah. point of view from the start of a race. I think it's yeah. it's uh yeah it's there's 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 changes that can definitely be made. So will be uh i don't know about you but i think maybe in the next few years they need to start fine tuning how they do their tv production yeah i, I totally agree with you though yeah definitely so uh that was our sort of three hot points for the uh for the this week and obviously now we will go on and just quickly discuss what happens we are of course an esports league here on formula one 2019 and gt sport and in fact the uh, gt sport league is ongoing at the moment thursday night at 8 p.m you can catch it on twitch.tv never misses the commentator there and uh, it's the manufacturers cup in gt sport on thursday night so make sure you check that one out if you want to get involved in gt sport go to the website invictusracingleague.com where you can sign up um, however, what we will be talking about is round three of the Invictus Racing League F1 2019 Championships. We've had five races this week, and it was around the French Grand Prix at the uh, Circuit Paul Ricard. And uh, we started off on Monday night, and it's the No Assist Championship. And Sab and I, of course, commentate on that one. You can catch Monday night at 8 p.m. here on this channel. So if you want to watch that one, press that follow and subscribe button. You can be notified when we go live for that. And it was Scopefielder takes the win and makes it a third different winner of the season. Sammy the Pitto made it a Haas 1-2 in second place. And uh, White Fountain with another really good result in third. Um, I'd also, as, uh, he's, uh, not just because he's watching, but also because uh, he did very well this week. Nick LJ Thompson with another really decent result in fifth place. Um, one of the, the new guys to the league and new to no assists. And Sav will we'll quickly... Uh, we'll go over all the the five leagues we've had, but with no assists, obviously we had first hand experience of what went on. A really nice win for Scope. Yeah, it was. Um, at first, you thought with White Fountain picking up the pole position, uh, you thought he's going to be doing what he did again in Monaco, and he started off superbly, didn't he? He um, ran off, and you thought you're not going to see the end of it. But uh, Sam also dropped back. Uh, we are. We, uh, we an incident, and you thought it's just going to be a tough day at the office for Haas, but Scopefield managed to reel in White, Fount um, White Fountain, and um, White Fountain never really recovered then, did he, from that? Uh, Sam eventually got past him as well, and yeah, White Fountain will probably feel like it's a, a win that's got away from him. He's, yes, he's finished third, and if he can keep finishing on that podium, we are going to run very close to the championship at the end of the season, but I think... Um, White finder will find it a bit frustrating that he didn't didn't take the win uh, Monday night. Yeah, the third podium in a row for Sammy the Pitto. Um, so the Spaniard doing very nicely. Has team uh, one two there, so that's uh, does wonders for their championship. Um, Scott, our reigning champion, Boy Ben OSB, he misses that race. And you were saying before we started streaming today, you think that his uh, his championship might be under threat this season. 
Yeah, I, I really do. If if he misses any more races, I hope he doesn't. But he, if he does miss any more races and you've got the likes of Sam, who's very, very consistent at the minute, he's always in that podium position places. And you've got Scopefield, the White Fountain, who's red hot, and you've got a few others around there as well who are all, all pushing for podiums and stuff. Scott's going to find it really tricky to... Um, to, to defend his title it'll be some defense if he can i think um whoever's uh, going to win the championship this season is going to really deserve it because there is at least four five six drivers in there who are, who are super fast and capable yep absolutely and next week of course we go to japan so it'll be monday night 8 p.m here on twitch.tv on this channel no assists go to the suzuka and last season it was sammy the pitto who took his first of four consecutive wins at the uh the track out there, the figure eight circuit, but the season before Scott won there in on his debut here in Victor. So uh, there's definitely all to play for and Scott will be looking at picking up a second victory at the Japanese circuit. Moving on to Tuesdays and we had the realistic performance league and uh, that was won by Ferocious Dan in the Ferrari. Uh, Jos in the Toro Rosso came in second and uh, Ton Albanac was in third. I can't remember what Tom was racing on 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 Tuesday night but uh, Ton, uh, Ton Albanac otherwise known as Wave and Tell he came in third and Sab it was uh, unfortunately for you it wasn't a race to remember but uh, it, was, it was it was quite a fun race to watch back yeah it was a tough race for myself there was a turn one on the, on the lap one incident and there was a, a Mercedes going sideways which you don't ever want to see turning into into the first corner and I tried to make avoiding avoiding uh, avoiding it and ran into the back of Scopefield and got the red wing of death and you know what it's like around Paul Ricard when you have the red wing of death you pretty much can't keep it keep it on the circuit so I had to somehow get the car back round to the the pits and made a decision to go two stop strategy and eventually worked my way round to uh, finish P9, which is not too bad to say I started from, from last. But yeah, the Ferocious Dan, who was also in the Ferrari, he he had a good race uh, out in front. I can't imagine he's going to be carrying that Ferrari for next week. But um, yeah, this this season's shaping up nicely because you've got some of the, some of the very quick guys uh, being challenged by some of the not so quick guys. So as Performance League is, it's um, it's throwing up some interesting battles what you wouldn't normally see in equal performances. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, it's uh, it's going to be one of those. I think it's going to be another one of those uh, seasons where we see multiple multiple race winners. And of course, I think it was a few seasons ago we saw was it eleven out of twelve different race winners, which was uh, it will be a hard hard time. I wouldn't bet it going close to that because there's there's a lot of talent in uh, in Performance League. And of course, if you are new to Invictus, the Performance League is done on realistic performance. Your car is allocate, uh, allocated dependent on pace. So obviously, if you uh, you did worse or off in the race before, you would get a faster car. Or uh, if you did better off, of course, you go down to a slower car. So we it, the 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 performance is somewhat sort of neutralized between the drivers so it tends to make it very uh, interesting because you get these faster drivers in slower cars making their way through a pack and equally you get the drivers are maybe not as competitive in much faster cars and having to uh, either stretch out a lead at the start or maybe fighting through the pack themselves and taking unlikely podiums or wins so yeah if you are interested in the performance league make sure you go to the website and check out the apply now section you can find out more about that there on to Wednesday night you've got the equal performance leagues we've got three on a Wednesday F1 F2 and F3 of course F1 the fastest league F3 uh, the not so slowest league but uh, it obviously it's the entry league so you've got uh, F1 was uh, the first one up 8pm on Wednesday and that was won by Scopefielder Archie uh, LR Archie in second position and uh, Davidson on in or in F1 this week with uh, returning back to league was uh, IRLT Cliffy and uh, Cliffy, uh, you some may know on the uh, he's a, a, a very fast driver. He did very nicely indeed to get himself onto the podium in his first race. But Scopefielder makes it two wins from t uh, well from two wins from three races over the the week, and um, he really seemed to enjoy uh, the French circuit. And you could see 
uh, from his his performance on Monday that he was definitely set up for a decent performance on on Wednesday, wasn't he? Yeah, Scotfield. are probably wishing he could uh, race around the French Grand Prix every week, couldn't he? He, he he's lightning quick around here, and um, he'll be hoping to take this form into Japan next week, where he. Um, where hopefully be, for his sake he'll be taking more wins. But yeah, Scotfield, uh, uh, red hot form at the minute is probably the best way to describe him. Yeah, absolutely. The Swede absolutely on fire, as you say. On to F2, Humberstone, fantastic win for him uh, around France. He took the uh, the win ahead of uh, equal deb- uh, another debutant, Esti, Esti Mats, the Estonian driver. And then Steen makes it three podiums in three races. And Steen, who's only been racing uh, on F1 for the last year and a half, has absolutely uh, come out of out, out of the blocks this season like a rocket and been very, very impressive. And uh, we had a, a really interesting race last night. And in fact, it went absolutely dreadfully for myself. But we went from a, uh, we had a wet qualifying session and then we had a dry start. It went intermediates, heavy rain, intermediates, dry at the end. And uh, so it was all about tyre care. And unfortunately uh, for myself, I didn't look after I didn't look after myself and put it in the wall. And uh, but it was, yeah, Humberstone, only a two stop strategy, did a really, really good job in, in managing his pace and his tyres. Equally, SD started, I believe he started 15th. So coming home in second is a fantastic result on your debut. He did very nicely indeed. And then, like I said, at the start, Steen, he's been uh, he's been the the real shock and surprise this season, and um, yeah, he's he's already uh, pretty uh, well stretching out a bit of a lead at the, the top of the table. So definitely one to look at as we kind of cross into the twenty five percent mark next week. Um, and then finally, it's F three, and uh, obviously you running in F three, and I'm sure you'll be delighted to let us know how that one went. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I'll start off with qualifying, shall I? Ferocious Dan took pole position ahead of Mike and championship leader Luke Bailey. Ferocious Dan, uh, Mike and Luke Bailey, well, the top five even, went with a soft strategy option, whereas myself, who qualified P6 on the medium tyre, I had a bit of an issue again. I seemed to be collecting them at the minute at the start, and I dropped all the way to the back and I had to work on my one-stop strategy to make uh, to get to the front. I knew with the guys that are starting on the softs that they probably won't be doing a one-stop strategy, and it worked out for me, luckily, because they both they all went on a two-stop strategy, which worked out for me. I ended up winning ahead of Mike, who Mike didn't have any time penalties. I had one, and I finished ahead of Mike 0.8 of a second with, with Ferocious Dan in third, Luke Bailey, came in in fourth, I think it was, and um, I think it was fourth, apologies, bear with me, sorry, he finished, Luke Bailey finished, sorry, he did not finish in fourth, he finished in eighth, so I'm way wrong, but Luke Bailey still leads the championship, we've had three different winners in three different races so far in F3, so it's been really exciting so far. Yeah, I think all leagues have been uh, pretty exciting so far, Um, in fact, Scope, I think, has taken the first three wins of the season in in uh, f1 so he's actually on like we said earlier he's really on a roll so he's um he's done very nicely indeed but leading the championship on no assist uh, is cpi Axe. he left the way down there in fact it's the way he's taken a podium so that's because in no assist night uh if you we do allow you to run the racing line however if you do you will be getting four points less per position than the guys that are running fully no assist, obviously, without the racing line. So CPI Alex is making use of the fact that he's running no racing line. So uh, moving ahead of Sammy the Pitto for the race or for the uh, championship lead. This, uh, on to Tuesdays, and it is Scopefield that leads the way in the Performance League. And uh, he will be delighted to be leading the way in both the Performance League on Tuesday nights and F1 on Wednesday nights, where he is the reigning champion with three wins, I believe it is, to start the season. It's looking like uh, he's the, definitely the one to catch. Steen, like I said, with F2, he's leading the way in F2, uh, He's leading the way in, in the Equal Performance F2 League and doing very nicely indeed. And he was absolutely delighted after the race uh, on uh, on Wednesday night and was pretty happy with his performance and can't believe where he is. And and uh, yeah, so credit credit to 
and he's doing very nicely and like you said Luke Bailey leading uh, in F3 after a strong start to the season unfortunately dropped off finishing in eighth last uh, last Wednesday but the last or the first two races first and second means that he had a little bit of a gap at the front so that's been knocked down now so I believe uh, plenty of drivers I think Mike Ferocious Dan have uh, caught up a little bit of gap and uh, you've probably given yourself a handsome amount of points in that championship challenge as well so that's the result for uh, for the five leagues over F1 2019, round three at the French Grand Prix. Like we said, on to round four, 25% of the season done uh, when we finish next week, and that is in Suzuka, Japan, for the uh, the race in the land of the rising sun. should be a, another very interesting race. It's not one of my favourite circuits to race on think or it's very tricky to get the, the right setup around there i don't know about you sam but it's one of those ones i find it very hard to overtake around there i've actually won in performance league around japan so i'm obviously going to say i love it <laughs> <laughs> but no it's it's a, it is a very tricky race and especially if if there's weather involved as well those uh those sweeping left and right turns can prove very tricky and with with a lot of gravel runoff if you're not careful you could find yourself in a, in a lot of trouble so japan it uh, it's going to be very interesting next week to see how everybody gets on hopefully for everybody's sake there is no rain because when it is rain around japan you're you're in trouble <laughs> so yeah absolutely so make sure you join us there monday tuesday wednesday next week f1 2019 all races stream live on twitch.tv you can go to the website invictusracingleague.com where you can find out more about how to get yourself on the grid for that one and of course as i said uh, the gt sport race uh, our league our gt sport league runs on a thursday night so it's currently at the moment and uh, you can catch that on twitch.tv and going to the website to find out more and uh, i'm sure he thought i forgot it as as he probably usually does but we will be finishing up with the hot lap question for sav i'll be giving sav a question it could be uh, opinion piece it could be a discussion it could just be his his, uh, his point of view whether it be uh, wrong or right from my, uh, my point of view uh, he has one minute to answer that question and let me know why he's given that answer and uh, this one's quite topical we've heard a lot of talk about it over the last few weeks or so so sab you've got one minute to let me know if and if so why should they bring back refueling in formula one I don't believe they should bring back refueling, personally. And a lot of people say they should, but I, I, I think there's too many risks involved. Yes, you get faster cars because they're not running with heavy fuel loads, but I just think it brings too many risks back into Formula 1. It brings the costs for all the teams back into Formula 1 up again because they've got all the fuel, fuel rigged systems and everything else to, to put back into the garages and what have you. And, I just think, me personally, it might add some more overtaking short term, but I think you just you try to put a band a band aid over a, over a broken leg. It's just it's just not the thing to fix Formula One at the minute. Well, nicely done inside your minute there. So if you disagree with him, let us know. Drop a message onto onto this channel in the on the stream you can we can sit back equally you can send messages or comments on the uh, on the the episodes on all of the podcasting sites if you want to let sab know personally you can follow him at alan sabatino on twitter or you can let me know at gt2 underscore driving on twitter and uh, if you'd like us if you'd like to submit any hot lap question ideas let us know on there and uh, oh no <laughs> we'll find out what you guys want to hear sab trying to get fit into a minute's worth of explaining but that is us done for this week and for episode eight we'll be back next week for episode nine and uh we've got a couple of ideas for the summer break about what we're going to be bringing to you so uh we'll look out for those on twitter i'm sure that i'll be i'll be tweeting out those and equally you can find out more about what's going to go on with the podcast by following the twitter for invictus racing league at invictus rl you can also follow it on Instagram at Invictus RL, Invictus Racing League on uh, face, uh, Facebook, and uh, there you go to the YouTube channel as well, Invictus Racing League on YouTube, where you can catch the streams back uh, for all races, sport races equally. If you stream back for this podcast and not listen to it on the podcasting sites, we upload it there. 
Uh, like I said, you can follow the stream and the podcast on SoundCloud, Spotify and Podbean. And we will be back next Monday for the No Assist Championship at the circuit in Suzuka, Japan. Next week's podcast. And uh, yeah, Sab, it's, uh, as, we, as we finish up tonight and we look back over the Hungarian Grand Prix, the French Grand Prix, which one was more exciting? Uh, tough to say, isn't it? Um, I'd say what we had this week is probably more exciting in terms of overtakes and and on track incidents. Hungary was exciting in its own way, wasn't it? In terms of race strategy and 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 battles like that. I um, I probably say uh, if if the people listening have a chance to watch back any of these French Grand Prix races definitely do so because uh, there were some interesting and good battles to watch there you go ring an endorsement so if you haven't already go to the youtube <laughs> channel and uh, watch the races back and I'd like to say thank you as well to the guys that have been watching our streams uh, especially on a monday night it's been really heartwarming to see the viewership numbers uh, really really uh, improve this season and uh, we've been getting some really good numbers so we're glad that you're enjoying it we hope that you're enjoying not only our races but equally the races on tuesday and wednesday nights and you join us for many more over the season we've got plenty more racing in the next few weeks and months coming up here in victus whether it's on in uh, f1 2019 or if it's on gt sports so you can catch it there and uh, for tonight like i said go to the socials if you want to find out more go to the website at invictus racing league Dot com. You can donate to League by going to the Invictus section on the website if you'd like to donate. If you are a community member and a driver, you get some perks that go along with it. If you're not and you just like to donate to League because we give you such excellent entertainment in the, in the, view, in the form of podcasting and streams, you can also do that. But thanks very much for joining us. We, uh, we had a great fun doing this one this evening and as always. But from Sab and I for this week and uh, until next week, very very good evening and we'll see you soon